Professor, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, faculty, students, it's really an honor for me to be here at the University of Cyprus today. Um, I take particular pleasure in being here because I truly believe in the importance of uh, institutions of learning, the role of professors and students, academics, to challenge established wisdom, to develop new ideas, to use knowledge uh, in the service of society, be it in technical field, societal field, cultural field. And uh, I always like to come to a university and speak with the people who work and study there. I have spent, uh, uh, I, I am 50 years old. It means I was born a few days before UNFISIP. So I've been around a little bit longer than the UN peacekeeping mission. Um, I spent, uh, I've spent uh, roughly half of my life as an academic. I was for many years at, uh, a researcher at the, um, uh, and a research director at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And I did a lot of teaching uh, at the university and I also corrected exams. Uh, so I've uh, been uh, seeing that part of life. And then I uh, uh, eventually became a politician and I've spent um, uh, 10 years uh, combined over in two different uh, periods in the Norwegian government. And my last jobs was defense minister and foreign minister in Norway. And now I uh, actually have two jobs. I have this one, which I will speak about today as the special advisor of the secretary general. And I also work at the leadership of the World Economic Forum as a board member and managing director uh, in Geneva. So that's where my base is and that's where I'm coming from. And that, that's actually relevant because I think that there is an important economic dimension in, a, in addition to the political dimension of the Cyprus issue, which I will uh, try to say a few words about. So good to be here and I feel very much at home at the University of Cyprus and also look forward to future exchanges with you. Let me start with the UN in Cyprus. As I mentioned, uh, the UN has been here with the peacekeeping force for 50 years, UNFISIP. Uh, so soon after uh, the establishment of uh, the independent Republic of Cyprus, uh, the UN was here and it's been continuously here. And we are here today principally in two different formats. Well, there's more because we also have UNDP and UNHCR, but two different formats that matters to this issue, which is the, uh, my office, uh, which is the uh, office of the Special Advisor of the Secretary General. We deal with the political talks and we're separate from the peacekeeping mission because we have parallel but separate mandates. The peacekeeping mission is here to as the word says, keep the peace. Uh, the, our office is here to assist the sides, the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot community in uh, their uh, strive to get to a negotiated solution. And as I think you know, over the, over the decades, the uh, Security Council of the United Nations has expressed itself several times on the issue of Cyprus. And it uh, holds uh, very clearly from the Security Council that Cyprus should be united, there should be one Cyprus, and it should happen through organized uh, dialogue, through negotiation between the two communities. This is actually, this has been and remains the view of not only the UN Secretary General, who is my boss in this uh, role, but also of the Security Council. Now, that may seem obvious to you, but I want to say that the world today is more divided than in a long time. And we see more divisions at the highest levels than anything I have experienced in, in, in my lifetime, and particularly anything I've seen since the end of the Cold War. Because since I'm 50 years old, it means I've lived exactly half of my life in the Cold War and exactly half of, of my life after the Cold War. Um, but that division has not, has not affected the Security Council on the issue of Cyprus. There is still unanimity among the Security Council, the 15 and the five permanent members about how this issue should be addressed. And this is a precious gift 
it's very important to keep it that way because when we proceed and when we achieve a negotiated settlement, and I do say when, not if, when we achieve that, there will be still a need for an active engagement for the UN, also in the transition into a new, uh, in, in a new situation. So that unity is important. I, I am also, over these 50 years, there have been, before me, 24 different people uh, trying to play the role of the negotiator or the facilitator of dialogue. So I'm the 25th in a long and honorable row of people. I actually think I am the last one. I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I, say I, I think I'm the last one because, but I hope I'm the last one for the good reason, which is that we actually achieve a settlement according to the principles agreed through negotiation between the two communities and we achieve the goal that was set out most lately in the, late, uh, in the, um, in the joint declaration of the 11th of February 2014 this year and also reconfirmed the 17th of uh, September this year under my first uh, leaders meeting that uh, the two sides want a bicommunal, bizonal federation with one single, um, one single uh, sovereignty to the outside world, consisting of two constituent states uh, with political equality, but democratic institutions that also respect the numerical difference between the two. This is a framework which is already agreed by your leaders, and not only the current leaders, but for generations of leaders have basically said that. I hope that I am the last, uh, last special uh, um, advisor to the Secretary General because we achieved this. What I, of course, fear or am concerned about is whether I will be the last one because it will not work and the international community and the people in Cyprus will make the final conclusion that actually it's not possible, it's not going there. I really don't think so. It's not my mandate. That's why I'm saying I think I'm the last one and I hope it's for the good reasons. And then I know that you should, last, as a, many years a politician, of course I know that you should never speak with certainty about the future because you will be checked. So I say that fully aware of that and not at all and very humbly that I think that's the situation. The way the talks are organized I think is quite familiar, but let me just briefly remi remind you that uh, the two sides, not the UN, but the two communities through their leaders, and the leaders are... Mr. Anastasiades, who is of course the President of the Republic, but in, when he meets in our format is the leader of the Greek Cypriot community, and Mr. Arolu, who is the current leader of the Turkish Cypriot community, have agreed, and their predecessors, that the negotiations will take place in defined chapters. Chapters on issues like property, the return of property, uh, uh, houses and other property in in, in, uh, in parts of what is now uh, the Turkish uh, Cypriot part and also some property on the other side, the return of territory, uh, the issues of economy, of security, of governance and power sharing, EU affairs. So it's a very structured set of um, areas that are being discussed at the table when we're at the table. As you know, we're currently not at the table. And I have studied this, these chapters very closely with my team. Uh, uh, they're well known to the UN, of course, but they're also well known to the two sides. So well known that sometimes we jokingly say when the teams meet that they could actually switch sides, they would be able to defend the other side because they've heard the argument so many times that, uh, that any all positions are in principle known. <laughs> having studied that in detail and having discussed both with representatives of the two sides, but also uh, with experienced people from the international community, I will say that I have the deepest possible respect that many of these issues are very difficult, but I have not found anything that cannot be solved. There is no absolute, there is no, there is no shop, showstoppers. There's absolutely no issue in any of these chapters which we will not be able to solve. <coughs> But in order to solve them, we need a level of trust and a level of will. If there is a will, there is a way. But as we know from everything, to, from global politics to our private life, if, if there is no will and no trust, any issue is big enough to create a big quarrel. 
So it's, 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 a, it's an issue of attitude and trust and to which extent you can actually believe in your, the other side. Our role again, as I said already, is to assist at the table. It's actually not my job, not my mandate. I, I was appointed by the Secretary General, but what happens when a new special advisor is appointed is that the two, the two sides in Cyprus are asked for their consent, then the guarantor powers, Turkey, Greece, and the United Kingdom is asked, and then the Security Council, uh, P5, the Permanent 5 is asked, finally the entire Security Council, and if there's full consent, no objections, the, the special uh, advisor is, is named. Uh, and, and there was broad support when I was, which was very good for my mandate, broad support from, from all the ones I mentioned when I was, when I was appointed. The, my mandate is to assist the sides at the table. It's not to get the sides to the table. This is an important, it's a banal but important statement. It's not my job to drag anybody to the negotiating table. So if I was very, if I had a narrow reading of my mandate right now, uh, very frankly, I could say to Mr. Rollo and Mr. Ansasat, the others, that I will, sorry for that, I'm too engaged here. I would, um, um, computer is fine. Uh, I, I could say to them that, well, but I'll go back to Geneva, I'll do my other job, call me when you're ready. It's not, I mean, you have to find out how to talk. But both of them have told me and continues to tell me that, no, we want you to help us to find a way back to the table. So when I'm doing that, I'm not doing that because I, for my sake or for the UN's sake, but because your leaders have said that they actually want me to see if there are ways I can get back. You will know that I had one idea which has been named the, uh, the formula, I, I never called it that, but that's fine, uh, which did not create uh, much enthusiasm on either side. Uh, it was uh, clearly, uh, it, it seemed to be too much for one side and too little for the other side. That was actually the point, because that's what the mediator does. But OK, it was not uh, no consensus, no hard feelings. It's not about me. But right now, we're waiting for some ideas to come out of the two sides and the neighborhood, you know, relevant states in the neighborhood, including Turkey, of course, on how we will be able to reconvene, to come back to the table. I'm not going to tell you that it's easy, but I want to tell you honestly from the bottom of my heart, I think we will. I think we will be back at the table, and I do not think it will take that much of a time. I do not know exactly when, I do not know exactly how, but I think it will happen. And the reason I think so is the combination of many conversations and my instinct, which says that at the end of the day, the two sides actually want to talk because they do know that leaving this unsolved is increasingly dangerous. It's increasingly dangerous. The structure of the positions here seems to be that, and, and I, some, you know, I had very good contact with, all, with both sides and also with uh, guarantor neighboring states. I don't not only go here, but I go to Ankara and Athens and, and speak to all the relevant players. Seems to be that we all want a solution. So most people I speak to, say, they don't say this, but what I hear is this, I want a solution but it should be a solution that's quite close to my proposal. Um, if I have to choose his solution, and I'm not, the reason I say his is this, it, there's a lot of men in this game, there should be more women, but I deliberately say his. If I want to take his solution, uh, well then I prefer stay to school, and, and vice versa, and then you reverse that. So the, the point is of course that in Cyprus, you have for, since the violence the, 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 and since all the troubles you went through, you have, after all, lived reasonably peaceful lives. And, and, and that is, which is great news. It's thanks to, you know, restraint on both sides, but also, you know, the UN peacekeeping force and the way the international community has tried to foster that. But that has also created the sense that we can, in principle, go on forever like this. I'm challenging that. And I'm happy to be challenged back. So um, please comment on this. But... I will challenge that because of two reasons. One reason is the, uh, it, it, from the security field, and the other packet, package of reasons is more on the economic front. From a security perspective, remember what's happening around you. The immediate neighborhood is in flames. 
it's worse than everything, anything we've seen, say, at least since the end of the Cold War and maybe in our lifetime. The Middle East is breaking up. It's not the normal trouble in the Middle East that always was there. You know, it's not the Israels and Palestine not being able to find a solution. It's the total collapse of the state system that was left uh, in the brief period between the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the end of the First World War, which was introduced where relatively where different tribes were given a state by the victors of the First World War. It's breaking up and it's really serious and we only see in the beginning. So the neighborhood is dangerous and the global setting is also dangerous and I'm concerned about it. I'm, I deal with, in my other job, I deal with these global challenges. There's a lot of fear, a lot of concern. There's even a fear that we're going into a time of deglobalization, that we're seeing you know, sanctions and counter sanctions and, and, and that you know, this idea that we were all coming together is about to stop. This is a particularly bad time to maintain a non-solution. It's a particularly bad time. It's much worse than in 2004 or 1994 or 1984. It's very different in 2004 to maintain a non-solution because what seems stable may not be stable forever when bigger forces come into play. I'm not saying when, what, who, but could happen. At the same time, you're also at the just at the brink of moving into a new type of economy, an economy I know well, being a Norwegian, uh, uh, a uh, uh, hydrocarbons economy, oil and gas economy, which means that you have significant natural resources, um, maybe not as much as some people think, but quite a bit, uh, that can be exploited and which could be a fantastic argument for working together. Because if your economy is based on financial services or tourism or agriculture, it does not really matter whether you have one or two economies. It matters, yes. It doesn't really matter. When you're moving into this completely different type of economy, it matters a lot whether you're able to make the optimal choices on transport routes, to sell, sell the gas in the cheapest possible way so there's more money for you, uh, whether, whether you're able to make the right decisions about how to develop a, a service industry, which, by the way, is where the jobs are. There's very few jobs offshore, and they will normally be filled by foreigners because you need people with long expertise. That's what happened to us. But you can create a lot of jobs onshore and in the maritime sector around an oil economy. But that requires decisions that you will take now in the coming years, which will, but will, will affect your life in 50 years. Very important. And this is not something I'm inventing. It's based on our own economy. It's happening now. In, in, the, in the energy field, Cyprus is now where my country was in the 70s. You just discovered all you're making these decisions. What we know about, if you tell me about a country anywhere on the planet, but you don't tell me where it is, and then you say that country just found oil and gas, my instinct will be, ooh, careful. Because statistically, that's bad news. No, listen to that. Statistically, that's bad news. Because if you haven't got your politics right, you're up for trouble. You're up for, in the best way, mismanagement, overspending, and Dutch disease which means the blow to the economy then collapses. In the worst of cases, it's not, not, not talking about you, but a country out there, theoretically, uh, up for deep political division, maybe violence, and high levels of corruption, and, uh, and undermining of other sectors, and a non-development of other uh, sectors with a more long-term uh, productivity. This is very important decisions, and you're making them now. These are strong arguments for a settlement, for getting clarity uh, to yourself and the outside world of why Cyprus is solved, why you, have, why you know when you can tell what it is uh, to the world. That, and, and you could also be you know, an attractive, an attractive uh, country for investments, uh, for being a regional hub in many ways in a, in, in a complicated region. So the security package of arguments why you should be careful, you the Cypriots, and not you personally, but you the Cypriots, should be concerned about a non-solution are stronger than ever, and the arguments for actually finding a solution are stronger than ever, in my view. At the same time that everybody can see, and we're not blind to this, it's much more difficult than before. Because for the, exactly the same reasons, there is more tension, more trouble around the hydrocarbons issue and the current crisis, the reason that we were not able to hold the very important meeting in October, which would be the 
because we did launch a new phase of final and strategic systematic negotiations towards the final settlement, uh, but we never got to the first meeting on the chapters because of the hydrocarbons issue. That's very serious. And I have deep respect for why it's serious, why it's difficult, and there's no easy way out. I want to tell you, and I'm sure there will be, you know, you um, take it for what it's worth. I think it's in my job to tell you what I hear when I speak to the two sides about this. So let me begin on the other side, on the Turkish Cypriot side. The argument in a distilled form is that hydrocarbons belongs to everybody. And since it belongs to everybody, we, we have to plan for it to be a common resource, not only revenue sharing, but also all the aspects of becoming an oil and gas economy will, will affect all of us. So we, I mean the Turkish Cypriots, need to be involved, informed uh, in one way or the other. We cannot be left out of this. It's not good enough to be told that at the end of the day you'll get your share. We'll do, take all the decisions, we'll share afterwards. That's a political argument which is widely held in the Turkish separate community. I'm not saying the Turkish Cypriots because I never ever have found a community where everybody thinks the same thing. But many Turkish Cypriots think so and Turkey thinks so. That's a political argument. On, when I'm on the Greek Cypriot side, I hear an at least equally convincing argument, which is, but we have the Republic of Cyprus. Of course, we can do all the exploration and in exploitation, exploration, exploitation that we like because we represent the state. The state is in principle for everybody. And when we unified, we will share the revenues anyway. So what's the problem? And, if, and then in that perspective, what's happening with Barbaros is, of course, it is a violation of the uh, exclusive economic zone of the Republic of Cyprus in international law, with that legal perspective uh, at the bottom. Uh, it, it's not an invasion, because you cannot, it's technically and legally and in any way impossible to invade an exclusive economic zone. You can only invade territory, territorial waters. Uh, but it's, it, it, it constitutes a violation. So the international community looks at this, and the international community has more than one perspective. One is the EE set and the legal perspective, where it sees that the Republic clearly has a strong point. And the other perspective is that we want, the, we want to help the two sides to do what they say that they want, which is to unify the island. And both of these perspectives have to be understood at the same time. Whereas the sides, and I, I'm not blaming anyone because I understand it, will only see one, one part of the equation, their own. And hence, one side is utterly convinced that we can only see this with my perspective, and the other side is utterly convinced that only my perspective is valid, and both are wrong because both perspectives have some truth. I'm not saying equal truth, but some, both of them have a point. That's why, um, that's why the, almost the entire international community that are concerned about that is talking as it is, which is clearly saying that we respect the rights of the Republic, but also always in the next sentence urging a speedy return to negotiation so the core problem can be solved. And you don't need to agree with that, but that's important, at least important that, that everybody understands. I think we are, we, you, the Cypriots, because again, I mean, I'm here to help. This, it's the Cypriots who have to make decisions. It's not only the leaders, it's people, NGOs, it's academics, it's uh, religious leaders, business leaders women networks, uh, all parts of society should think of this. You are approaching some kind of moment of truth. I don't want to paint it too dramatically, but I don't want to underestimate it either. I don't think there will be an understanding for a perpetuation of the current situation into eternity. At some point, which is probably closer than many have thought about, a, some kind of choice has to be made whether the two sides actually want to live together. In my view, and this is not only in my mandate, but strong, my strong personal conviction, it is much better to choose that living together. But it requires some engagement with trying to not only get back to the table, but to deal with it. It will not be easy. It will, even if we, and even, you know, even if we get the solution at the table, and when I speak about the table, it's literally a table at our offices up at the UN, uh, where the parties meet, uh, and also metaphorically the table, even if we get to a conclusion there, it still has to be 
presented to the communities for referendum, as what's happened in 2004, and then, of course, it was rejected by one side and accepted by the other, but that means it was not accepted. Or, and, so it has to need a, a double positive vote, and it has to be implemented. And I'm already, I mean, even if we are not negotiating now, I spend quite some time to think and talk with people about implementation. Because parts of the implementation, I think, will be relatively easy. We basically just do what's in the agreement. But other parts of implementation, for instance, on property, may be a good deal on the macro level, but it will affect individuals in a very concrete sense. Some people will get back the houses they've been dreaming of, and they will be really happy. But some other people were living in that house, and they will be less happy. Some people will not get back the house they were dreaming of because that was not the part of the equation. And somebody else will be happy because they stay where they are. There will be a lot of personal implications, which is why it's not enough just to work towards a settlement at the table. We need to work at the settlement in the minds of the Cypriots and the willingness to actually to embrace and live with that settlement. It's not easy, and at times I understand why people say this looks too bad, no, not too bad, but too complex, uh, too challenging, too different from my daily life. I want to stick to what we have, but then I come back to, I would be careful to believe that status quo is here to stay. Final point. Academics, professors, teachers at university, students have a particular role in society. Uh, I think you have a particular role in challenging established truths and using the knowledge that you have and that you actually keep for society and develop and, and refine for society also to think about the future and think in new terms. I think it's incredibly important that people here think about, try to envisage a kind of a scenario of a future where you are together. How, what would it look like for good and bad? Not only the good news, not only the Pollyanna story, but what would a united Cyprus actually look like? And try to, try to think now about the challenges and the opportunities that this will mean for everybody in Cyprus. And uh, I think that's the role that I will encourage you to try to play. And uh, I also know from uh, many years in academia that in an academic um, crowd, there are many different views, almost as many views as there are people. So uh, I look forward to an engaged debate with you all. Thank you for the attention. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, privilege and honor to moderate the discussion. Thank you very much for uh, your talk, insightful, forward-looking. It was part of my job to present also the speaker, I have his CV, but uh, he feels at home, as he said, so he presented himself. Mm -hmm. Briefly, I'll just say that he has uh, devoted his uh, whole life, political career and uh, professional career in serving peace. And uh, as we just uh, saw and heard, he's also an eloquent speaker. <laughs> Uh, let me just uh, say a couple of things very quickly, two minutes, uh, just uh, to say that uh, this very long and special relationship between Cyprus and the UN actually goes back a bit longer than mm. when you were born, or <laughs> most of us were born, because the first time the Cyprus issue was on the agenda of the General Assembly was actually in 1954. Different problem, colonial issue. Mm. But uh, unfortunately, until today, it is still very much on the agenda of the United Nations, of course, in a very different form today. And uh, le looking, going back to the 60s, let me add one starting point, if you wish, to mention that uh, the President of the United States at that time, Lyndon Johnson, called the Cyprus problem one of the most complex problems on Earth. Unfortunately, we can say today that he was right in one way. Anyway, this was the past. We look forward. We look to the challenges and the opportunities uh, of the future. And um, we hope that, uh, indeed, Mr. Aida, you'll be the last one to serve in this uh,
capacity uh, in Cyprus. For, for so, the good reasons. For a good reason, <laughs> obviously, obviously. And uh, I'll stop here and uh, we'll open the floor for discussion. Let me just say that uh, we have to finish, be done by 7.30. Please identify yourself. Do we have microphones? Yes. We do. But what about the front seat? Because the first question, the first row. Anyway, speak loudly. Identify yourself, please, and uh, your question. My name is Marcos Mavromadis. I am the president of the Council of the University. I take the opportunity to thank you for coming to us and, and giving us your thoughts. I would urge you to do so more often to both communities because it was an inspiring presentation of your thoughts in a Scandinavian manner, I would say, where you express your views in a more straightforward way that we were used to with other special advisors. <laughs> I will not ask a question, I, but I want to make reference to two attributes of you which I find extremely interesting and extremely promising. The first one is that you are the first special advisor that comes from Europe. Mm. And I think this is very positive because no matter what very many people think, Cyprus is a European country, we aspire to be a proper European country and functioning as a European country. Therefore, you know Europe well as a former foreign minister, you are aware of all uh, uh, European matters, you are you know very well the European Union, irrespective of your country not being part of it, and we aspire to our country being based and governed on European values. And the most important one, if I may say, especially in the case of the European Union, is that the willingness to compromise. This is something that all Cypriots need to understand. Mm. The second one, the second special attribute to you is that you are the first special advisor who comes from a NATO country. Not very many people know that, mm. but I find it positive in what way that uh, the security arrangement of the new state of affairs is extremely important. It is something that it has not been discussed in the last, uh, in, in all uh, rounds of negotiation throughout all these uh, decades. Uh, and I believe it is something that, that it is extremely important to find a new way of the security arrangement for the Federal Republic of Cyprus. Simply, we need to think out of the box, we need to think of other <coughs> ways of dealing with security issues. And as a former defense minister, you are other capacity, you know NATO very well, mm. so maybe you can have in mind ways and means that can help us deal with these new security arrangements, simply because the previous one, the existing ones, the theoretically existing ones, the 1960 security arrangements, belong to the Cold War era that mm. it has ended, are so outdated that uh, cannot continue, so we need to think extremely innovative and find new ways. So I sincerely wish you Thank all you. the best in your mission and I sincerely hope you'll be the last one, but always for the good reason. Thank you. My name is Chris Haji Dimitriou. I was born in Famagusta in 1962. Mm -hmm. I am a refugee for 40 years. I want to go home, yes. I want to live in my hometown. Can you please tell me, take me by the hand and lead me to my house in Famagusta? I, want, I will show you the way. Can you please tell me why I'm still a refugee after 40 years? Can you please tell me who does not allow me to enter and live in my hometown? I'm not a politician. I do not know many things. I am a mother who wants to see her children live in a united island, in peace, in safety, in justice, in democracy, in cooperation, in creativity, in prosperity. Can you please put yourself, put yourself in our shoes for a moment? 
And when you are tired from work and you want to go to the place you call home, to rest and relax. Can you imagine for a second that if another Turkey occupied your home country, hometown, home for 40 years and did not allow you to go to live there? Would you like to share with us your feelings, your thoughts, your plans and your actions if you were in our shoes? I understand that if the great powers that rule the world nowadays want our problem to be solved, so it will be. But please remember, the Cypriot people, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, are not numbers. We are human beings. We deserve to be treated with justice. And we have the right to go home. This may be a detail for the great powers, but for us, is a human right amongst others. P.S. Many foreigners wonder why the people of Cyprus. Many foreigners wonder why the people of Cyprus do not get out in the streets to protest about the problems that others impose to us. Why we don't get out in the streets to protest like the Spanish people, for example? Los indignados y agonizmeni. Please, uh, I'm concluding can I get now. More questions. Yes, yes. Please. I was trying to give an explanation for this, and all, the only thing I could think of is that our religion has taught us to suffer and endure with patience and pray for better days. But though I respect and obey my religion, I believe that this okay, behavior... Okay, thank you very much. I don't mean to be arrogant, but uh, we have to take more questions. Please. I need to add something to the very short. Because of very short. Uh, the lady spoke about from Augusto sentimental terms, but we've got also a legal responsibility to enforce or help enforce resolutions. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Resolution 550, where the United Nations wish or related myself to go back to our homes. Of course. What the Bureau of is doing to enforce your own resolutions. Thank you. And thank you for a very informative. Thank you. Uh, excellent questions. I will begin with you because that's exactly what we're doing. We want you back to Farm Augusta. And we want to back you to everywhere you'd like to go. Uh, and, uh, I, and the whole point is that the, the, the part of the negotiations that has to do with with uh, property and territory are about exactly those issues. I mean, the conclusion will be found by the sides. And, and which town, when, and in which proportion, of course, is at the end of the day a matter of negotiations. But the Turkish Cypriots already at the entry point to uh, negotiations accept the principle of the return of territory, territory and the return of property. What has not been settled, and that's going to be long and tough conversations, is the percentages, who is going back to which house, how long down in the line of ancestry, and so on. This will not be easy. But the principle is part of my job. It's exactly to make it possible both to recover certain properties, but also for free movement across uh, the whole island in one unified country. So the answer is exactly yes. What I'm not going to do is to take you tomorrow and fight the Turkish army, because none of us will probably come particularly well out of that. But the point, the, the point is here that we're trying to, through negotiations, find a way where these issues are finally solved. But they can't be solved if we don't talk. So the problem right now, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that with any lack of respect or understanding, but right now, technically speaking, the problem is that your president is not at the table. No. When I understand why, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's the problem we have. And so what we're trying to do is to create the conditions by which he can come back to the table to see Mr. Erolu at the table and continue the negotiations which will begin for the first time with property and elements of territory, rather than putting that to the end as was previously, previously attended. So the answer is, to your letter is basically yes. And if you wonder if I can put myself in your shoes, I can. I think, I, I understand it's extremely painful. And I understand that it's painful for a lot of people. And I also understand, because I speak to communities on both sides, that there is a lot of pain on both sides. Because there is, a, you know, as, as I mentioned, 
the UN peacekeeping force has been here for 50 years, not 40 years, 50 years. That's 10 years before the, uh, the, uh, uh, for the events of 74, and the UN has been engaged in 54. So there's a long history here of troubles uh, and problems and challenges, and there is eno enough spilled blood now in Cyprus, and we need to move ahead. I am very interested and in trying to learn everything I can about the history of the conflict, the history of Cyprus, also the good, you know, the cultural heritage history. But what I cannot do for you is to change your past. What I can try to do is to train, help you change your future, because that's the only thing that can be changed. And if what I've seen in a lot of places, including around where I live myself, that the relevance of history depends on whether you have concluded things. Because old history, for many of us, is old history. It's interesting. I mean, we, used, we Norwegians, we used to hate the Swedes until we stopped hating the Swedes and like to love them. And now we hardly remember why it ever occurred to us to hate the Swedes. But that has changed because things change. But when you have these perpetual non-solutions, you keep then, then old history becomes extremely relevant all the time. So that's one of the ways. And the Swedish ambassador is here, and he nods. So it's probably the other way around as well. <laughs> So you see what I mean? So we're trying to solve it, and thank you for the lecture, we're trying to solve your problem. No, sorry, yeah. we move on to the next questions. Thank you. thank you very much, thank you. The gentleman over there, and then from this side, the gentleman there. Sorry, I didn't yes. get my answer about what you're doing about 550. Well, well the, the, I mean, my mandate is about uh, help. My mandate is to help the two sides at the table, and a solution will I mean, if we got to a solution, that will simultaneously mean that all the resolution of the UN will have been achieved, because they are aiming at the unified Cyprus where everybody can live together. So that's what I'm doing with 550. Of the international community uh, on the lack of uh, settlement after so many years. On the other hand, um, we have to realize the disillusionment of the people of Cyprus with the ineffectiveness of the UN in uh, establishing some kind of symmetry in the whole process and in the negotiations. Uh, there is no symmetry in terms of power, military, political, or otherwise, or size. And so far, the Greek Cypriots perceive the way the process has been um, progressing as one-sided. I mean, the sequence of uh, issues that have been discussed have been always uh, altered in such a way that concessions have been uh, made from one side, while the important issues and the concerns and the worries, the, the grave worries of the Greek Cypriots, namely security, uh, namely the demographics, namely the long-term uh, survival of the community, uh, have not been put on the table. And now, um, of course, the, the, the argument would be that the, the order has been agreed. But now a new issue arises, and any negotiating power that the Greek Cypriots have is being put again at the table, so any card that they have in their hands is taken away. While on the other hand, uh, why, why, the other, sorry. Why? I mean, the, the natural gas, the energy issue. Taken away. Uh, well, if it's being put on the table, and especially in the context of uh, dividing ahead of any, uh, of any uh, solution, uh, any proceeds, that uh, any value that that argument has evaporates. On the other hand, the other side has been allowed for 40 years to hold a city hostage and essentially let it go a waste as a bargaining chip to be returned at the end. So there is an apparent, an obvious lack of symmetry. If anything would go forward, perhaps the UN, we can think out of the box and reorder some of the issues and make apparent some of the benefits that the Greek Cypriots can expect, especially with respect to security, with respect to um, any balance in terms of demographics, and these sort of issues. I think that has to be part of it. Thank you. One more question. You can take the, the gentleman there. Yeah, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Menelos Hadjikostas, and uh, I'm a reporter, so I'm just going to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, um, perhaps if I could get you to elaborate on your actual proposal, you can flesh it out for us a little bit, what it is that you proposed. Second, 
Um, it seemed to me when you mentioned that coming to a moment of truth, we're going to get there sooner rather than later, there's an undercurrent there that kind of like speaks of a warning to everyone. Some would interpret that as a threat. That, uh, and I wanted you to expand on that a little bit, what exactly it is that you mean. The UN will pull out uh, people, uh, disillusionment and uh, fatigue of the international community is a given with this problem going on for so long. But what, it is, what is it exactly that you're saying? That people are just going to quit on Cyprus, turn his back, and you know, amicably split? Uh, is that what the uh, suggestion is, the insinuation? And third, uh, you spoke about a trust deficit. Um, definitely. This is all about perceptions uh, as much as it is about political realities. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do you convince now a public, and how would you sell any uh, solution, at least in the near term, to a public uh, who's so thoroughly convinced that uh, um, you know, there's this uh, country in the north of this island that can do whatever it wants and uh, yeah. you know, can bully its way into anything. So I'm, I'm saying right now I don't see how you know, talks can move forward with this trust deficit that this whole situation has, uh, has created. So. OK, can I pick up on those? The, um I take your point on the balance and the sequencing, but uh, when, I, when we did achieve agreement from both sides that we would start with property and elements of territory, that's a change. Because traditionally the other side have been insisting that we should do everything that has to be governance of power sharing and basically move everything later. So that's a change in the direction you're asking of, and we achieved that. Uh, previously it has not been achieved. Why exactly poverty? Well, <laughs> property, sorry. Why exactly property? Uh, well, I personally happen to think it is very crucial because it's essential to the daily life of people in a way that some of the governance issues is not. But much more important is because what your president preferred that we put first. So I listened to that and I got that. And of course, it's paired with what was the primary desire of the other side, which is governance and, and uh, power sharing. So, so um, that's exactly what we're trying to do, to have a, have a balanced approach where we take issues that are of particular importance to either side and take them early, rather than to postpone everything difficult uh, to the end. And on security, I'm, we, I, I'm be the first one to say I'm very, I've been working many, many years, as you said, on security and, and defense and, and also security arrangements. I, I can talk about it tomorrow. But right now, uh, my understanding is that neither side wants to begin with security, and of course I can force them if they do not agree. So we have an agreed order of, of uh, sequencing, at least where we start uh, when, we go, when we go back to the table. So I, I, your point is perfectly well taken. When it comes to the issue of balance, one, one of the, and I, I'm very frank with you, and I also want to say that I, I, I make a point of saying the same thing to any audience. So I'm not going to say anything different here than I will say in the North. I will not say anything different in Tur 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 Turkish separate side. And one of my observations, and I'm here, so I try to you know, at least be honest and you can disagree with me, but I'll tell you what I think. I observe that it's intrinsic to both communities' self-perception that they are the underdog. Both seem to be feel that they're the underdog. And then I see you, well, how possible? So when I say that to a, you know, to a Greek Cypress, how can we be the underdog? Look, they have the whole Turkey with them. Uh, so yes, there are a few Turkish Cypress, but the entire Turkey all around us is with them. So of course we are the underdog. If I say the same thing to a Turkish Cypress, say, of course we're the underdog. So they're a member of the EU. They are, they are recognized by the whole world. They, are, they have the state. They have all the institutions of the state. Of course we are the underdog. And they mean it. It's not, it's not a play of words, it's, it's perceived as the underdog. So I'm actually trying to, and so there is a, there's an asymmetry, yes, but it's an asymmetry in opposite directions. There is a clear advantage for the, Turkish, for the Greek Cypriots that they also de facto control the state. Uh, and there is a clear advantage to the Turkish Cypriots that they have a very big brother very close. Uh, that supports them. And, and both is true. It's not that one is wrong and the other is right. Both is true. But it's important in order to penetrate the sort of the deeper levels uh, of this. On your uh, question, and thank you for that, because I, I, I like to have an opportunity to tell you what I actually was proposing. 
uh, because it's widely misunderstood. Now, for, before I do so, I do that because you tell me, because I'm not proposing it any longer because the size didn't like it, so it's gone. I'm fine. But for historical record, I was never even close to proposing co-management. I was never even close to say that the Republic of Cyprus has stopped drilling activities, no. I was never ever close to say that it was legitimate for anybody else to do it. What I did say was that I suggested that the two sides could name some people, some wise men and women with experience and, and knowledge, to sit together and think about how a future unified federal system should manage these issues if it came into being. And with an explicit reference that none of what was talked about would have any bearing whatsoever if there was no solution. So it would be at zero cost to those who feared that they were giving away anything. That was my proposal, quite clearly presented to both leaders. One leader thought it was too much, another leader thought it was too little. And uh, hence it's gone. That was what I was proposing. And, 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 and just, it's, it's actually good to say this. Um, what important for me, it's not only about revenue sharing. That's sold. Everybody agrees there's no difference. Everybody says revenues will be shared. It's existing existing um, convergences which, will, which can be repeated at any given time. But in, as I said in my, sta in my speech, an oil and gas economy is not only about revenues. It's choice of technology, speed of introducing the, the money into the economy to avoid the Dutch disease. It's a political question, not technical, political. Transport routes, that's an economic choice. Where, where do you want to send it? Would you send to Egypt or, or Turkey or both? And what does it cost? how much money is left in your own pocket when you've paid for all the installations. Speed of extraction, which means that the speedier you take it out, the less there will be left. So do you want it to long term or short term? Deconflicting with environment, deconflicting with uh, tourism. You don't want to have, have oil spills all over your tour most best beaches. And where do you place the service industry where all the jobs are? Who's going to get the, who's going to get the ports? These are not technical issues, they're deep political issues, and they do affect, if, since I believe that there will be a unified Cyprus, it does matter for any Cypriot. And so, so since, since there is only one recognized state, and hence that's the only state that could do drilling today, clearly, then allow both sides to think about the future where there is a unified state. As part of the negotiations? No. Because it would, in my proposal, it would not be negotiations at all. It's a reflection group. That means, uh, it, in, 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 I, I don't think there is a Cypriot version of this, but in, many, in, in my own country or in the United Kingdom, there's something called the Royal Commission. Royal simply because we have monarchs. But basically, where you say, here's some very esteemed members of the society who know something. They're not necessarily leaders or politicians, but they know a lot of that issue. Please take a few years, make a, make a group travel around the world, look at alternative options, and come up with a kind of proposal that we will then take to Parliament and discuss at the Parliament. That was my idea. But it didn't fly, and I'm fine with that. The next two questions, the lady professor, and then the gentleman. It's what, I think this is quite, please. let him get the vote. Please. No, I have a couple more. No, couple is not possible. One more. No, no, no. It wasn't a Oh, sorry. Which one? Yeah, the trust. Yeah, no, no, uh, no yeah, you, how can you go to the talks without trust? True, that's my point. You need to re-establish trust. And then you need to do something to re-establish trust. I have one uh, mandate and one mandate only, and the Security Council and the UN, through the Security Council, has one view, which is that Cyprus shall be unified. It's not to find any solution, it's to find a unified solution. Uh, and I am not, neither do I want to, nor am I in position to threaten anybody. What I'm saying, I'm observing that, you, as, and, and, and as an observer, as I can also be, I say, don't assume that this will continue into infinity. That, you know, you will have a major international effort, spending a lot of money, resources, uh, just to go on and on and on and on, not finding a solution. Because somebody, not me, but somebody one day, one day may say, well, you know, if we tried for whole lifespans, maybe we're on the wrong track. So I'm just saying it's not around the corner, but don't assume that you can just have this status quo where nothing will change. And it's also based on what I've seen elsewhere, because there are 
places can be stable until they are not stable any longer. And then things can change ra quickly. Okay, the next two brief questions, please. I have to and go then to over there. Yeah. Uh, my name is Calliope Capio Josefitis. I'm at the Department of Social and Political Sciences of the University of Cyprus. Um, I have just a question on uh, um, what are, f uh, for you, the challenges and opportunities uh, for the um, gender dimension in terms of um, decision making. Because Cyprus, I'm also on the board of the European Institute for Gender Equality in Lithuania, and Cyprus, although it does not have the, the worst overall score, uh, in terms of uh, women in decision making, uh, has only 12 out of 100. So it's the worst score in the European Union. And I wouldn't like the new, so the Cyprus after the settlement, to still continue on this track. And allow me to share with you today we had something from, uh, from my department. Unfortunately, in the Department of Social and Political Science, I'm the only woman. <laughs> and uh, we had a strategic discussion uh, this week, and I haven't been able to get that issue in the agenda on the strategic planning of my department. So if this is not done at the university, I doubt how it can be done outside of the society. And I would like to hear from you how your office is organized, is organized in this respect to move this issue forward. Thank you so much. Am I right to conclude that <coughs> the logic behind your views may be your mandate? Even your proposal on energy uh, is based on the acceptance of the de facto situation created by the Turkish invasion, i.e., and I refer to the geographical separation of the population on the basis of religion and race, and work towards legalizing it, is that from what you said tonight, to me, this is, this, this is my conclusion, and I would like you to verify it or dispute it. Unfortunately, that will be the last. I'll take that first and then come to you. Um, I will dispute it uh, because I am actually not doing anything else than what the, your own president and several previous presidents and Mr. Rolu and several previous leaders on the Turkish Cypriot side have asked us to do, which is to organize talks according to the known chapters uh, so that you can reach a bicommunal, bisonal federation for all Cypriots that will be based on two constituent states. That's not my idea. Uh, it's, uh, it's the idea of the political leadership for a long time in this country. And it is, uh, at least in principle, broadly supported, even if it, we're not talking right now. So I didn't invent this. I'm doing what I'm asked to do, not only by the UN, but by the leaders of the two communities in Cyprus. So in fact, you're verifying my conclusion that you are out here to help them who decided that the geographical separation created by the force of arms should be legalized in the form of a bisonal bicommunal federation. Well, I would actually ask that question to President Ansasiadis since she has, he has declared that he wants a bicommunal bisonal, and you can ask Christophe. You're right. And you I, well, I don't every dispute. Other, every other president that you had. Uh, and I didn't invent it, I wasn't here. Well, the, okay, what... you, you, you're right, if I may, please. Yeah. To Let's get something out of this. Your point is it's... well taken, but uh, we do not agree. You're right that our leaders, our leaders... Uh, uh, Dialogue, please, yeah. please. Uh, well, I have not, we, we cannot have a conclusion if we can't have a, a, a cross-examination like this. Otherwise, yeah, these I... seminars don't serve any purpose. Please. Okay. If you give you 10 seconds, what would you, what would you like me to do? What would I like yes. you to do? You represent the United Nations? Yes. yes of course. The United Nations Charter, does it approve that a country invades another? And then no. we start meddling with discussions in order to legalize a situation that is created by the force of arms, even if the local leaders... There's very few conflicts I know of where the Security Council expressed itself so many times, including on the issue of the invasion, and the entire foundation for what we're doing is based on those resolutions, which are international law. And on top of that, 
it is accepted by a whole generation of your own elected leaders. And I can't really do much more than that. But I... And what about the people's no, decision in, in 204? Please, we move on. Sorry. I have, an, but then to the extremely important gender question, I'm, I'm really happy that's the last one because it's a very important one. The... Um, I, I work in the World Economic Forum. We produce many statistics about global comparisons, and the two most famous ones, and most quoted, is, is the uh, Global Competitiveness Index uh, and the Global Gender Parity Index. And, and, and of course, uh, and both uh, countries would like to be high and not low, uh, which means high on competitiveness, and, but a low number on uh, gender parity, uh, di gender difference, because that's high parity. Um, there is a surprising degree of correlation between the two, which basically says that a, a modern country that wants to get richer should also invest in women and men and should utilize the talent equally. Another insight we have is that in conflict situations, m traditional gender patterns are perpetuated because conflicts are typically construed in masculine patterns. It's give or, give or take, it's uh, zero-sum games, you win, I lose. Uh, so I think it, it, it's incredibly important to have a gender perspective and gender analysis of the Cyprus conflict in its broad perspective, but also the details, you know, property issues and so on. So I would, I'm not going to mingle with university politics and the University of Cyprus, but as a general statement, I think that this is extremely important research and highly relevant for politics. And in many other conflicts where I have been involved as, Nor as myself or as Norway, we have explicitly said we need more women engaged in negotiations because they will bring other perspective. I don't say better perspective, but the broader yeah. flutoria of perspectives. I'm sorry, but they have to design my university here. <laughs> the University of Cyprus, some of the 100 universities in Europe, would number of lay professors. Thank you very much. That's good. Among the 100 universities. Excellent, that's great. I'm news. sorry, we ran out of time. Uh, let me thank our distinguished speaker once again, and of course, we thank you all for being here. Thank you.